The first session is district scale design strategies. And we're going to look um, not so much at a, at a building level scale, but at a more urban scale, a district scale, and a city scale. And we're going to look at some, uh, some design principles uh, and some strategies. So it's probably uh, a lecture which, when you're getting involved in your design studios later on in the year, it might be worth having another look at this lecture and just reminding yourself of some of the strategies. So, the impact of buildings. Just to remind ourselves, uh, buildings use about half of the world's energy. Um, I mean, I think that figure is, uh, has been updated slightly, but buildings use a huge amount of energy. So, very important that we minimise the energy usage in our buildings. Greenhouse gas emissions, if you look at this diagram here, put in a year, in terms of direct greenhouse gas emissions, buildings are about 6.4%. Transport is about 14%. And then looking at the indirect carbon dioxide emissions, buildings add another 12%. So if you add that 12% to that 6%, you've got about 18% of buildings contributing to greenhouse gas emissions across the planet. Also then industry here is, is a major factor, 11%. Also of relevance to, to architectural and urban designers, transport is 14%. So that's, that's a big factor. And certainly in terms of urban design, you, you as an urban designer, you can make a big influence on transport distances, transport journeys. And very important, strong relationship between density and oil consumption. So if we have a look at this graph here, we've got the density of buildings in an urban environment. And that's, that's measured in terms of persons per hectare. And then up the other axis, the annual oil consumption. And you can see there's this close fit line which is drawn clearly demonstrating that if we go to, say, for example, London here, London is, is reasonably dense at about 50, 50 people per hectare, and its energy consumption is, is sort of reasonably low down here. If we go to a much less dense city, if we go to Houston in the United States, which is a very sparse city, very, very spread out. It's not a compact city at all, with a density of about sort of 10, 10 people per hectare. The, the oil consumption per inhabitant is hugely greater than our London example. If we then go to a very, very dense city, Hong Kong being the example here, much, much denser, the oil consumption is hugely lower per capita of population. So a really important um, relationship between urban density and oil consumption. Okay, looking now at urban areas. Um, the build-up of urban areas, they create greater turbulence than rural areas. So in in urban areas, you get these greater turbulence effects. And you will notice this probably at some point this year when you walk outside the Arts Tower and we're getting very turbulent wind flows. The buildings, that, that wind can't flow directly through. It's getting changed direction. You're getting this turbulent flow, which can be a problem. And generally, urban areas slow down the passage of wind. We've looked at this a little bit in, in Abigail's lecture when we looked at CFD, we looked at uh, natural ventilation. But just to look at the graphs, in an urban setting, if we look at the altitude 
of the y-axis and the wind speed. In a, in a city, the, the wind speed is lower than in a, in a rural area. But within a city, that wind speed does increase with height to the point where, again, as Abigail referenced this, when you're looking at very high buildings, you again, you have a very strong wind, even though you're in an urban setting. And then if you compare that with a, with a sort of suburban setting, you get a wind reduction, and then comparing that with the, the external uh, setting. And one of the implications of this may be that polluted air can be trapped in urban corridors because that, that wind flow simply can't be pushed through to clean out the polluted air. Okay, so looking at airflow, I've got a few, few diagrams here. Cooler fresh air flowing into urban areas will be promoted by flow channels with less rough surfaces. So this is a diagram of flow channels. And the example here given is, is Hamburg. And what we're talking about is wide roads, rivers, or open spaces. And these create the flow channels that allow the flow of fresh air from the countryside into the cities. And as you see from this diagram, because the wind direction in many cities changes throughout the year, the optimum is to have a number of flow channels to bring that airflow into the city centre. Now, using roads, using large traffic routes as flow channels can be difficult because um, you've got a lot of pollutants on those roads. And so at the moment, those flow channels could be bringing those pollutants in. However, we will be moving to electric cars globally within the next 10 to 20 years. And electric cars at source, i.e. the car itself, does not create any pollutants. So this phenomena could be significantly different in the next 5, 10, 20 years when all of those cars out there are electric it may be quite possible that large urban highways become successful flow channels for cities. So it's changing rapidly. Okay, radial flow channels um, are these ones. The ones that are called radial because they're on a radius from the centre to the outside, or from the outside to the centre. Concentric flow channels, represented by the diagram here. And concentric flow channels are channels which do not flow from the city centre to the sorry to the outside, but they're in they're in sort of rings or they're in large they're large urban spaces. So for example, Central Park in New York, which is a very large open space. Okay? Um, I think Central Park's about Three, three or four kilometers long by about a kilometer wide. It's a very, very big green space. And these can be successful because although they're not necessarily bringing in the fresh air from outside of the city, they're allowing the, the polluted and the, the, the hot air within the city to disperse within that green space, to, to move away from buildings and potentially then to move up into the atmosphere. So both can be affected. So let's have a look at an example. This is Sheffield. Okay. So here we are. City centre. Okay. If you haven't explored yet, that's the city centre. Sheffield has the Peak District over on its um, west. Okay. So it's a very large area, sorry, it's a very large area of countryside, you know, open space. Um, now what we find in Sheffield is we've got radial flow channels. So the blue dotted lines 
are the radial flow channels that we have in Sheffield. And the ones on the left, on the west of the city, are particularly effective because they're flowing from open countryside. The ones on the right, um, they are effective, but they're flowing more in, in sort of urban corridors um, from urban areas. So they're probably slightly less effective. But certainly these blue ones are effective on the left. And I'll just, uh, sorry, just to give you an example here, um, I'll just open the Google Map. I'm going to see if I can get rid of that music. Okay, what I, was trying to, what I want to show you in Sheffield here is, this is Sheffield City Centre. Just zoom in a bit here. And this is Eccles Hall Road, and this is Encliffe Park. And Encliffe Park is one of these uh, airflow routes. And you can experience it. It's quite amazing, actually. If you, if you stand here, there's a, there's a sort of bridge over the, over the river there. And it's quite amazing. If you walk down Brocco Bank, you get to here, you feel this incredible temperature drop as the air is flowing through that green space into the city. And, and it's, it's, you know, it must be four or five degrees centigrade, this, um, this pressure, this temperature difference you can, you can experience. Really, really amazing. So if I just zoom out again. So you can see this green, this green link here is this flow channel that flows into the city. Now it probably, it was designed more for recreational purposes, but it is now serving as a flow channel for fresh air for the city. Now the problem potentially in Sheffield is it doesn't reach the city centre, so it stops about here. Ideally, it would continue and it would reach all the way into the city centre. And there are, there are other benefits because if you create um, these continuous green paths, also in terms of biodiversity, you create a path into the city for wildlife species. Okay, urban heat islands or UHI. Temperatures in cities are typically higher than in their rural surroundings, particularly at night. And this can be anything in the region of 4 to 10 degrees centigrade. Okay. This is exasperate, exasperating the impact of heat waves. So when we have a, a hot, particularly hot period in a, in a region, so let's say, for example, we have a hot summer in Sheffield, it's particularly worse in cities because of the urban heat island effect. It also reduces the effectiveness of nighttime passive heat purging. So in, in a temperate climate, it's very effective to use the cooler nighttime air to cool your building down. But this becomes less effective if you ha are experiencing urban heat islands. It's particularly significant on clear, still nights during warm periods of weather. So when there is not much wind 
to refresh the air in the cities, we get a, a much more significant urban heat island effect. And we've recorded urban heat island temperature differences of 9 degrees C in London. So in other words, if you were stood, if you were stood in the countryside, close to London, and the temperature was 22 degrees centigrade, in the centre of London, the temperature was, was 31 degrees centigrade. So 9 degrees warmer because of the urban heat island effect. And that's an image of a, of a city with the colour the color scheme showing the temperature. And you can kind of see, as we move towards the edge of the city, this is in Fahrenheit, which is American, but we're getting these temperatures down more in the range of sort of 50, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, and then as we move into the city center, we're much more in these sort of 100 degrees Fahrenheit temperature scale. So a good illustration there of urban heat island. Another example here, that's the aerial photograph of the city. And if we overlay the thermal map, you can see quite clearly the heat which is being accumulated in the city centre compared with the adjacent rural areas. Okay, so the causes. Concentration of heat sources such as buildings and traffic in city centres. Okay. The storage of solar energy in the urban fabric during the day released into the atmosphere at night. So in a city, we have a lot of high thermal mass materials. We have concrete, we have tarmac. This absorbs the heat from the sun during the day. And then at night, it starts to release that heat. So even though the outside air temperature has cooled down, the city fabric is acting as a radiator giving out heat. Urban areas are typically drier than the countryside and therefore you get reduced levels of evaporation and evapotranspiration. So we've got less water, water evaporating creates a cooling effect. Evapotranspiration, i.e. plants, creates a cooling effect. In certain climates Urban areas may be cooler during the day due to solar shading effects. I should say effects, not defects. So in some climates, the buildings can create a benefit because they're creating a lot of shading. Okay, the cooling effect of vegetation. If we look at um, another example here, uh, so here's the aerial image of a city and you can see the, the, the green areas, the areas of vegetation and then the grey which is the sort of city areas. And if we overlay the heat, you can see how much cooler our vegetated areas are. So if we go back, the heat is generally Being trapped in the urban areas and if you look if you look at here this is Central Park this white which is a, a, a big pond just make that out there is it's black in the in the thermal plot telling you that it's it's the coldest so that area of water is is really effective as well okay so we're going to move now into some principles on a more sort of district scale. So looking at buildings, but looking at buildings within their district, within their urban setting. So wind speed is influenced even at a large distance from a windbreak. So if you have trees, for example, creating a windbreak, you will be reducing and affecting the wind flow even quite a distance away. Windbreaks can lead to energy savings because in the cooler months of the year you're not cooling your building down 
with high levels of wind flow. But equally, you can have a reduced cooling effect in summer. Now, it depends what you're designing. If you're designing a, a workplace or an education facility, generally nowadays in Europe, the concern is with keeping that building cool in summer. So you might look at a strategy like this and decide that this is not appropriate because although this is providing some shelter in winter, it's reducing your cooling effect in the summer. And the, the wind speed is influenced even at a large distance. If we look at this diagram here, H is the height of your windbreak and this is showing the wind speed intensity. So when you're about five times the height away from that windbreak, you've got about 50% reduction in wind speed. When you're about 10 times the distance, you've got about 65% reduction. By the time you get 20 times the height away in distance, your wind speed is only reduced by about 85%. And built form can be used for wind protection. So in this diagram, we have a combination of vegetation and the actual buildings themselves blocking a clear path of the wind. So because these, these planted vegetation areas and the buildings, because they're kind of interlocking, there's no clear path through here for wind to flow. So this would be very effective for, this is a housing scheme, for preventing those sort of high levels of wind flow, which for a housing scheme would be very beneficial. Sustainable urban drainage. Okay, non-permeable surfaces contribute to local and city scale flooding. So what we're talking about here is we are experiencing more severe um, weather conditions globally and many parts of the world are experiencing higher levels of precipitation and flood events. We've always had flood events around the world but it is being noticed scientifically that these flood events are getting worse, they're getting more frequent, and they're getting more severe. So it's a really serious issue. The problem with cities historically has been that we build all of our cities with non-permeable surfaces. Tarmac, concrete, paving, buildings, all surfaces that when the rain hits those surfaces it cannot permeate and get into the ground. So when you get a flood, when you get a, um, sorry, a, a high level rain event and that water hits the city surfaces all it can do is run off into the drains or into the rivers because you're getting very little um, permeable flow into the ground. And if you look at a, some of these examples on the right hand side, we're looking at the runoff coefficient. So when rain hits that surface, what proportion of the rain runs off the surface as opposed to what proportion of the rain is absorbed and permeates through the surface. So right at the top we've got roofs. Building roofs with a pitch greater than 15% runoff coefficient of 1. So in other words all of that rain which hits that roof runs off very very quickly. Okay. There's no absorption and there's no storing of water. Concrete and asphalt, 0.9. So 90% will flow off. And only that very small 10% is actually held on the surface. Hard paving, 75%. And then we move down to get into the more permeable surfaces. So, for example, rooftop gardens, much better. 
only 30% of that rain will flow off immediately. Grass, gardens, allotments, with allotments and gardens, you know, much lower runoff. And finally, parks and amenities adjacent to bodies of water can be classed as nil, zero runoff, because all the rain that hits those surfaces flows into those bodies of water rather than flowing into rivers or the, the drainage system. And they can be stored in those bodies of water. So we, we call it rainwater attenuation. Attenuation meaning you're slowing down the flow of rain. And in most of Europe now, when you're designing any new building or any new urban area, you have to do quite complex calculations to demonstrate that you have good levels of rainwater attenuation. So you're designing to capture that rain. Okay. So let's talk about sustainable urban drainage. And you might hear people talk about SUDs. SUD, that's what they're talking about, sustainable urban drainage. Or, but often it just gets abbreviated to SUDS. And here's some good examples. So if we look at the, um, the, the top of the diagram is a sort of bad example. And we've got a conventional tiled roof. All that rain just, just flows off that immediately. And we've got impermeable paving. And again, most of that rain just flows into the drains. Now, if we look on the example at the bottom, we've now got what is called source control. So we've got a green roof here. And we've got permeable paving. Permeable paving allows a lot of the rain to permeate through it into the ground. You can sort of see that on that on the represented by those arrows there. So at source, we're controlling that runoff immediately. We're capturing it and slowing it down on the green roof, and we're allowing it to permeate through our paving. Now, moving on then to site control, we've got a few measures here on a site level to prevent that rain from creating flood conditions. The first is a swale. Okay, and a swale is simply a, it's kind of like a, a ditch, it's a, a recess in the ground, and for a lot of the year, it's dry, and you can put plants in it. Okay, when you have heavy rainfall, the rain from your permeable paving, from your roofs, can flow into the swale. And the swale will fill up with water. And then that swale, it's not a river, so it's not, it's not flowing anywhere. It's just a, a, a body of water on the site. That swale traps the water, and it can then slowly dissipate into the ground. And that might trap that water for maybe a day or two days, by which point it's normally stopped raining and the sort of flood conditions are no longer existing. And then moving on to that is a balancing pond. So we're talking here about a big body of water, you know, a pond or a lake, something substantial and which has the capacity to change its water level. Okay, so during a drier period, it will be designed so that the water is at a lower level. And that has to be carefully designed because normally these are seen as kind of amenity spaces. People want to enjoy these ponds. So you need to carefully design the edges of them so that they work whether you're at a high level or a low level. In a storm event, these act a bit like a swale, but they're much bigger stores of water. And these can store several days' worth of water before it disperses into the ground over a longer period. 
Okay, then on a regional control level is storm or main drainage. Now in some cities of the world, you have very, very large storm drains, which are designed to handle the huge flow of rain um, in, in a kind of storm event. We don't have those in the UK, we just have a normal drainage system. And the intention in the UK and in most of Europe, in, in Northern Europe anyway, is that through these measures, you've reduced the flow into your drains. The, the problem that we've experienced, and um, I mean, we had a flood in Sheffield, seven years ago, Sheffield flooded. And what happened was, the, there was so much water flowing into the drains that they, the drains overflowed. So they couldn't cope. So that water was then flowing into the roads. The, 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 rivers were so, um, the rivers were so high that they couldn't carry any more water. And we had flood levels in Sheffield city centre of, of a sort of two metres. Um, you know, and it caused a huge amount of damage and, and people lost their lives in it. Um, you know, so it's a, it is a very significant design issue nowadays. So this is just repeating what I've mentioned here. Seepage through the surface, permeable, permeable drainage, permeable surface um, paving. Sometimes you may have gravel-filled trenches which will absorb more water, or sometimes you can bury these, so you don't actually need to see them. Infiltration ponds we've talked about, so a big pond which allows that water to slowly disperse into the ground. And that can be improved again by having buried trenches, which just gives you more capacity to store water. And you can have a combination of both. Porous paving or permeable paving. Basically, you have normal paving, but it it allows the water to disperse between the paving stones. And what you normally have is a filter layer to trap any, any oil or petrol. Uh, and if it's, a, if it's a car park area, you normally will have a, a trap so that if a, if a car, for example, um, emptied all of its petrol onto that paving, you can trap that petrol before it goes into the drains or the rivers. That's what they look like. So these are swales. So the one on the left is a, is a swale. It's currently dry, as you can see. It's planted. You know, it looks quite, looks quite attractive. It's fine. You can see it has these um, sloping sides. And you could imagine, in a storm event, you could, you could store a lot of water in that. And then the one on the right is a swale, but we have a gravel-filled trench here, just to, just to store more water. And as we mentioned, the presence of water can be a free source of cooling. So these big watercourses can help cool your buildings. Okay, looking at a few more design principles now. In cooler climates, ensure that the buildings will receive good levels of sunshine throughout the year. So in the northern temperate zone, you need to avoid shading your buildings all, all throughout the year. And deciduous trees, trees which lose their leaves in winter, can be particularly effective. They will block 85% of the sun's radiation in summer. Okay, and in winter, they will allow 70% of the sun's energy to pass through their branches. So, you get an incredibly effective shading device, which will automatically adapt itself throughout the year to the seasons. So, incredibly effective. A 
western tree belt will provide shading from the afternoon sun and this west sunlight is often the most difficult sun to block um, and it can lead to overheating so this can be very effective to avoid overheating which is to use a, a, a a tree belt to block that western sun. The main facade of the building should be solar oriented. It's very important that you consider your orientation of your building. And in the UK and in Northern Europe, you typically face your building so that the main facade is within 30 degrees of south. And the reason for this is that it's then very easy to shade that um, higher south facing sun. So horizontal louvers will easily shade that hot sun. The west, the low west sun is more difficult to shade. That's, that's the tricky one. The, the morning sun, so the sun in the east in the morning is less of a problem because typically you're trying to heat your building up during that phase. But the problem with the west sun is if you imagine this room, that's where we're facing, we're facing east, aren't we? But this room we, we will put heat into it. So let's say you're in this room at three o'clock in the afternoon and it was heated up to 22 degrees. Now we're not west, west facing, but imagine we were on the other side of the arts tower. And then the sun comes out from behind the clouds and starts hitting our glass. So we've already got a comfortable temperature. And then we get all this extra heat from the sun and our temperature goes up to 28 degrees, 30 degrees. So that's why the west is, is much more difficult to control. Summer shading there, just a few examples of different types of shading. Shading needs to be on the outside of the building. Okay, really important, this kind of internal shading is only effective in terms of daylight and glare control. It is not effective in terms of heat because the heat is already in the building. Summer shading on the east and the west facades. So the sun is too low for horizontal shades to be effective. So if you have a horizontal shading surface like that, but the sun is low, it will shine straight into the building. And so this is why vertical fins, vertical gardens or deciduous trees can be effective. And if you look back when we, were, when we used Climate Consultant, we used that shading calculator to demonstrate this, this effect. Correct orientation is vital, especially as we design for climate change. Okay, looking a little bit now at the UK, the temperate climate of the UK. And we've got some kind of general design principles here. So generally, high thermal mass for temperature stability, high levels of insulation, and avoiding infiltration, so avoiding the wind flowing through your building. I'm going to talk about thermal mass in the session at two o'clock today. Buffer zones, secondary zones such as kitchens, bathrooms and storerooms, you can use those as a thermal buffer potentially between the inside and the outside, so they protect the inside spaces from the outside. And typically, Small windows on the north side of your building, larger windows on the south, typically, okay? And ground source heat pump technology is effective. And again, I'll talk about that at two o'clock. And so a few more principles here. Cross ventilation. So in the northern temperate climate, we, we can definitely keep our buildings cool enough with adequate ventilation. Cross ventilation means that you're allowing the wind to flow through the building. One-sided ventilation 
is this, where you just have one opening and you're, you're expecting the air to flow in and out through the same opening. And as Abigail demonstrated in her lecture, often you just get a lot of turbulent, turbulent flow, very poor ventilation. Um, yet yeah, warm rooms to solar orientate, oriented face. So you can have solar spaces that will gather heat, potentially. Um, roof overhangs protect the fabric from the rain. Um, we do get a lot of rain in the northern temperate zones, and, and not so much in the UK, but more in, in, in Germany, Switzerland, Austria. The, the typical buildings will use very large roofs which overhang to protect the building from the rain, stop the building getting wet. Because if, you're, if you're, the walls of your building get soaked wet by the rain, that cools your building down due to evaporation. Okay, so we're going to stop there. And um, as I say, I think t with today's lecture, the thing to do is just to look at it again. So probably in a month's time or, or later on when you're doing your studio work, just have a look at some of these principles and try and see if you can start to use these principles in your design projects. Any questions? Okay, great. Thanks.